Thank you, Brendan, and thank you for the invitation to speak today. Why have I called this a missed opportunity? Well, without actually being in the room, I'm pretty sure that what's going on in Brussels right now is that David Cameron is standing up there saying, we want to keep the British rebate. François Hollande will be standing there saying, we want a bigger common agricultural policy. Enda Kenny will be saying, we need much more cohesion policy money coming to Ireland. The Poles will be saying we want the common agricultural policy and the cohesion money. So we all know what they're dis discussing. We all know that they're tired debates. We've heard them for the last several rounds of the multi-annual financial framework. So what I'm going to try to do is be a bit different today and say what might be a more interesting way of dealing with the European Union's finances from the perspective of governance. It's the missing element in all this governance, governance reform. You've heard about banking union, we know about fiscal union, we know that political union is what the Germans want to see, but nobody talks seriously about the role that the European budget could play in a reformed and re-governed European Union. So that's what I want to attempt to do by putting a few things on the table. Why, do we, why might we want a different form of budgetary governance? Well, the first reason is that it makes sense to do certain things at European level because it's the appropriate level at which to pitch these particular policies. Most of them are, are various forms of public investment. And the question that we have to, we should be addressing, which we will not be doing in the Justus Lipsius building right now, is where do we get added value from doing things at European level that we might otherwise do at national level? Now, some of the answers are straightforward. A common external action service is something that pools the capability and still provides all the services to European citizens. So it makes sense to harmonise and consolidate and integrate external action. Research, when pooled, gives you greater clout in international markets. And we know that European research is one of the success stories of the European budget. And I could go on and on with these, these sorts of things. So it's where you complement and get better added value from the, the allocation process of public finance. The second demand, one which is very evident during a crisis, is that we seek solidarity from those countries in reasonable circumstances to those countries in perilous circumstances. But this does pose a question, because solidarity in, in a typical national budget goes from rich to poor, those in work to those out of work. So do we draw the lines at saying solidarity stops at borders? We allow a little bit of solidarity across borders from country to country, but the European level has no responsibility for the citizens in individual countries. That is the current social position. Social policy is a national competence but there may be some solidarity mechanisms across borders purely at the level of governments, bailing out, providing loans, the other, other forms that we've seen as this crisis has unfolded. A third question is whether this is something we should set up as a permanent equalisation system. Now, any Germans in the room will tell you that the Finance Ausgleich, the, the equalisation between lender in Germany, is a very uncomfortable phenomenon. It takes from the rich regions like Bavaria or Hessen and gives to the poorer ones like Mecklenburg for Pommern. They don't like it in Germany. So they're certainly not going to extend that to Germans paying for Greeks on a permanent basis. But temporary support is a different, different animal entirely. You can think of using temporary support as a way of dealing with particular problems which are predominantly macroeconomic. So I think that solidarity could extend to saying, let's invent some new temporary mechanisms which can work to deal with crises as they unfold, to the, the famous asymmetric shocks that we hear about in the economics. And then there's a more contentious question, which you can see on screen now. This was part of the, the June European Council conclusions, what, and uh, reiterated in the October European Council conclusions. The euro area, it said, needs some sort of fiscal capacity. And the translation from that was that it's a fiscal capacity able to stabilize the euro area economy as a whole. Now, the ways in which this could be done it could be through having some form of automatic stabilisers of the, the, the sort that has been mentioned already, in which what happens is that as the economy goes up or down, 
more taxes raised when you go up, less taxes raised when you go down, more public expenditure is induced when you go down. That automatic stabilisation is a feature of any mature economic union. The trouble is, at European level, there is no automatic stabilisation built into the budget. Nor can there be, realistically, when it's only 1% of GDP. Except when you start to consider two levels. Automatic stabilisation could, in fact, work from the EU budget for the smaller member states, because their GDP relative to the EU, uh, EU budget is much smaller. So a, a smallish component from the EU level can help very much to stabilise an economy like Ireland's, Greece's, or even Cyprus's when it turns down. So we should consider this interaction between the levels and not merely the fact that the EU budget as a whole cannot stabilise the EU as a whole in the way the federal government is able to do in the US. That could be taken further by some form of discretionary uh, capability. You can intervene at your discretion if you believe that stabilisation is at risk. So that is something that, that could be seen as a new sort of governance demand that we need to work on Something that the four presidents' report has mentioned but not really elaborated is extremely vague in the way it's expressed at the moment. So what's the, what, why not? What's the difficulty in this? Well, you won't be surprised to hear that there are quite a lot of them. The first is that, once again, if we think of what's happening in the Justus Lipsius building in Brussels today, what they're all arguing about, the fundamental, fundamental political decision, is the net balance. How much do we put in? How much do we get out? It's bean counting in the, of the worst possible sort. And that bean counting takes the form of, come on, remember, remember the handbag, we want our money back. Or, we're poor, you need to help us. Now the Irish were very creative about this in the previous round when, when Ireland said you must continue to give us cohesion policy support notwithstanding the Celtic tiger miracle because we've only been rich for a short time. <laughs> I think it might have been Rory Quinn that, uh, that, that mentioned this particular idea. It was wonderful Irish inventiveness, but it's a variation on you need to help us. And it's all about net balances. So this is the dominant political decision that's being made at the moment. In addition, the line you're hearing, from, particularly from the, the richer member states and the net contributors, is fiscal consolidation is happening everywhere. Therefore, logically, the European Union budget must also be fiscally consolidated which is a roundabout way of saying cut. Now, th does this make sense? Well, there are two reasons to argue that it doesn't make sense. The first is that it's a budget for the period 2014 to 2020 that's under discussion. If we're still in crisis by 2016, then all bets are off in any case. We would hope that the crisis is on its way to being resolved. So we should be thinking of, in medium term about the EU budget and not relating it to the circumstances of 2012 or possibly 2013. It's also potentially false as a proposition for a different reason, which is that as member states are constrained, you could argue that the fiscal capacity of the European level really ought to be increased to enable things to happen that are being stopped in member states because of fiscal consolidation. So I would actually go so far as to reverse the, arguments, the argument here and say there's an argument for a bigger EU budget precisely because member states are in difficulty. And yet, it's very hard to persuade electorates of this. And we, we heard much from the minister about uh, uh, democratic legitimation. It's very hard to persuade electorates who are being squeezed particularly the Irish electorate, that more should be spent at European level because that's your money. Why can't you spend it at home on nurses? Just as an aside, you, you do know that uh, in, in the British system we don't measure public expenditure in pounds sterling. We measure it in nurses. How many nurses will this cost? <laughs> Any proposition. How many nurses is the European Union budget going to cost us? That's the way we analyse things. What you also see in this is that there's something called a negotiating box. It sounds like a very uncomfortable contortion. Maybe Harry Houdini invented it, in which all sorts of things are put together. And each of these involves what the German political scientist Fritz Scharf has called the joint decision trap. The trap is that you can't get, reach consensus, so therefore you go for the lowest common denominator, and therefore you never move forward. Each country shows up at the negotiations with its famous red lines. 
These are the things that we may not cross. The British rebate, the common agricultural policy for the Irish and the French, etc. Things I've already mentioned. And in all of this you find horse trading going on. You, you must smooth the, the, the deal by saying, well, we'll give you this if you give us that. That's the, the way the, these budget negotiations take place. And under, underpinning all of this is conditions. Under what circumstances do you give more money to a certain country? Greece is the most egregious example of this because the Greeks are being, having conditions imposed on them day after day. But they're not the only ones who, who face such, such constraints. So can we break out of this? Can we, Brendan? Realistically, can we break out of this? There is, I think, an economic case for this, for a, a, what I would call quasi-federal approach. And that is to combine stabilization and solidarity in various ways. In other words, to have mechanisms in place which will bring about transfers when they are needed to, co to countries which are shocked, and particularly downward shocks where the, the economy is hit. We need to imagine what can we do with the Constitution. The European Central Bank has actually showed great imagination, not, not normally a characteristic you associate with central bankers, in the way it's interpreted the treaty. I think we need to do something similar around the fiscal arrangements in the treaty. This could include a number of things. EU-level borrowing capacity. We could aim for new cross-border flows. We could say that under the next multi-annual financial framework, why don't we accelerate spending in the countries that need it at particular times and slow it down at other times? You use a test of whether they need stabilization impacts. There's nothing in the rules to prevent any of this. We could make it easier for certain countries to borrow by using the instruments such as the European Investment Bank to complement what's available through immediate public finances. In other words, make it easier for countries to borrow cheaply. That would resonate well in Ireland, I think. We could use various forms of buffer funds. They, they've been experimented on in other countries. Finland, for example, has a, a form of social, ins social insurance in which you can run a small deficit in bad times and run a surplus in good times. That buffers spending over the economic cycle. And much more controversially, I hesitate to say this in Ireland, you could consider having common taxes as a way of generating money which could be used to generate a stabilisation fund. And the most obvious one, I hate to say it in Ireland, is a corporate income tax. Because if you pull corporate income tax across countries, you would smooth out many of the infelicities that, that, that it gives rise to. But there are tensions around all of this. And those tensions are the things we need to sort out because of the wrangling we see in the Justus Lipsius today. So my concluding comments on this. If we genuinely want to move towards whatever fiscal or political union means, and let's face it, we're not very clear what these things mean at the moment, what we have today by way of an EU budget simply won't do. We need to move beyond it. And that means we need hard choices to be made on the mechanisms that might be, might be countenanced for the future, something that needs time to bring in, may need new institutions, it may even need a European treasury of some, some description. Clearly, there are the many obstacles not the least of which is, is cre potentially creating divisions between the Euro area members, the, the nine other members who are compliant with these things, and a certain country that uh, is always going to be in the awkward score. So those cleavages need to, be, need to be dealt with. And we need to sort out the problems of moral hazard. You don't want to be offering countries which are cavalier with their debts, even easier borrowing, because that, that would just induce them to borrow even more than they, they do at present. And I think we need to work out who speaks for taxpayers. Is it the European Parliament or is it national parliaments? But having said that, the missing link in all of this governance system is that we do not have a European taxpayer. We only have national taxpayers. And in the absence of a European taxpayer, it's very hard to move forward towards a new sort of budgetary system. That, that is the missing discussion in the governance debate at present, and it's one that I would advocate calling on. Now, Kevin's already mentioned Keynes. We didn't concert in this, but there is a very appropriate quote from Keynes that I'd like to finish with. I'll read it out because I know we're on, we're on camera. The difficulty lies not so much in developing new ideas as in escaping from old ones. Thank you. Thank you.